Perfect. Good morning. This is Tyler Crone with the Thundering 36. We are so delighted to be interviewing one of our Seattle City Council citywide position candidates, Tariq Yosef. And please go underway to introduce yourself. We are delighted you're here. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Um, you all are doing some awesome work in the 36th, and uh, it's it's still to this day one of my favorite um, favorite parts of the city. Um, I'm Tarek Yosef. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I've lived in the city of Seattle, or I've lived in the Seattle area my whole life. I grew up in South Seattle in the New Holly neighborhood, um, went to the University of Washington for both my undergraduate and master's degree, and I've loved this area so much that I just decided to stay here long term. And so I think that's given me a unique experience. You've seen the city change dramatically over the course of the last two or three decades. And in a lot of ways, those changes have been positive, but there's a lot of places where the change hasn't been equally beneficial for everybody. We've seen a dramatic cut in social services over the last, uh, last few decades and especially the last few years. The city has a reputation and a tradition for helping those in need. And you still see parts of that today. I uh, ended up in a hit and run on Mercer the other day and immediately three or four people came to check if I was okay. And that while the incident itself wasn't fun, it was inspiring to show that there is still that deep, deep care for people. And I think that that is currently missing in our current city council. I think that we have kind of lost that tradition in our government. And I think that fundamentally our government needs to take a position of deep empathy and compassion for the people that uh, it serves. And so while uh, there's a lot of great candidates out there, my hope at the very least, uh, if not if not to get into office obviously, is to at least help to shift the conversation to be more deep, deeply compassionate and empathetic and create a city for everyone. Thank you so much. Our first question this morning will be asked from Laura Marie. Hi, um, so if elected, to which standing committees of the city council will you seek appointment and what special qualifications do you bring to the ongoing work of those committees? Great question. So the three the three committees that I'm interested in most are Housing and Human Services, Libraries, Education and Neighborhoods, and Parks, Public Utilities, and Technology. Uh, I'll start with the last one because that's where most of my traditional qualifications come from. I work as a privacy uh, technologist uh, in my day job, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about the preservation and protection of human rights, um, not just within data privacy, but also technology ethics. And I think as the city becomes uh, a higher tech city with technologies that are being rolled out, not just by law enforcement, but also utilities and um, uh, administrative use, it's important to have those um, have, have those concerns captured. The other two, um, libraries, educations, and neighborhoods, and housing and human services, comes from a, a deep passion that I have for social services. Um, uh, like I mentioned, I relied on Seattle, uh, Seattle Public Housing, King County, Seattle Public Health, um, Running Start, the Husky Promise, all programs that are meant to be that safety net that helps bring people up. And so that is really, that's the the, the core of the reason that I'm running. And um, I've done a lot of work on the individual and community organization level. Um, I've been involved uh, in one of our local organizations, Wasat. They've done a, a fantastic uh, um I can't remember the uh, the name of the program in this case, we Neighborly Needs Program, to help provide foods, uh, especially in food desert areas uh, of the city. And those are, uh, I would like to see and, and help work towards expanding those programs, um, especially with uh, the leveraging the power of local, the rich local communities that we have here and helping build out um, both a government response to a lot of the social challenges that we have, as well as partnering with these local communities that have been doing the work for so many years. Thank you so much. Our next question will be asked by Alex W. Hey there. Uh, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all 
including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? It's a good, it's a, it's a good question. Um, my, my core belief in this is that we are over leveraging police um, for way too many problems. Uh, the challenge of having any agency, police or otherwise, that is given a you know six or seven week set of training and then told to so solve every problem that happens in the city is just setting up both officers and the agency itself for failure. And so a lot of my focus is looking at what are um, ways that we can address core root issues that uh, affect that are kind of uh, causing a lot of the problems that we're seeing that a lot of that can come from social programs that help people get back on their feet after homelessness. Um, a lot of it can be public health response to people who are uh, dealing with fentanyl or opiate addictions. Um, and I, I think that there is, there needs to be a lot of work to look at the types of problems that we are dealing with and take a data driven approach and look at the way that the city, um, the types of problems the city has and looking at beyond the city and looking at other parts of the world and how they've solved these problems and frankly coming up with creative solutions to move that money and use it more effectively. I think that, uh, so overall, kind of recapping that, I think that the we need to more clearly define when does it make sense for an officer with a firearm to show up. And I imagine that there's a lot of cases where that doesn't necessarily make sense. I think we be, need to be more deliberate about the times that we have government intervening in some form or fashion to the individual community lives that we have. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Barbara. <clears throat> Excuse me. How would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track meeting Seattle's new Green Deal goals? So it's a great question. I think one, one of the projects I've been really interested in is, um, since being introduced to them, is the, the concept of resilience hubs. And this is really great for both uh, a climate perspective, but also just a general community resilience um, initiative. I think that one, what I'd like to see concretely from the, um, to get us kind of back on track with this plan is, is very uh, hyper-localized responses and resources that help um, at a almost block by block level of the different neighborhoods and communities that we have. Um, a part of this is going to be kind of investing in the existing community centers that we have there and ensuring that they have the resources to um, both help with and respond, whether that is um, meeting cooling centers in the summer or, or um, having emergency supplies that are there that can be distributed to the community in case of um, natural disasters, um, but also hubs for local community, trusted community organizations to be able to um, help fill the gaps where uh, there are challenges, there, the city is currently having challenges. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly within refugee communities, uh, BIPOC communities, indigenous communities, where we've had organizations that have, that have been led by those people and have built a lot of trust. And I think we need to focus on using some of the Green New Deal uh, programming and funding to help lift those organizations um, and, and help them be be the, the great partners that they already are and can continue to be. Thank you. The last prepared question will be asked by Jeremy. Um, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address the crisis? So it's a great question. And honestly, this this was the um, issue that frustrated me enough to run. Um, Fundamentally, I think that the way that we are approaching homelessness is we're trying to treat it as something to wash away or push away literally and figuratively versus something to actually address and solve. Um, something that I say is that w I remember when we declared that we were a sanctuary city, we need to be a sanctuary city for everybody, including the people that are already here. 
And so looking at, you know, last year, or was it last year or the year before, there were a thousand homeless sweeps in the year. That is more than three per day. And people that we either sweep or end up in prison, we are spending more than it takes to stay in the Ritz-Carlton uh, to put them into prisons and to over-police and embarrass and shame them for something that is completely out of their control. And so I think that the core problem is that we need to start addressing um, what are the circumstances that got people to those situations. Part of it is a combination is a temporary uh, issues that have happened where someone's lost their job and couldn't find a paycheck, someone's rent was raised, and then find issues to resolve those. And some of them are chronic. Um, people like veterans that have, um, have been dealing with uh, mental health or physical disabilities. Um, people that have um, are dealing with kind of chronic um, mental health challenges. And so I think we need to really find a human-oriented solution. One of the key things I would like to expand is social work, um, allocating more social workers to help work with individual people and figure out, hey, you're here six months from now, how can we get you to a better place? And I think that's what we need to do to really meaningfully get out of this situation and this loop that we've been in. Thank you so much. That is the end of our prepared questions. And what we will do now is have a round of any follow-ups that our board would want to ask you. And I will recognize the raise the hand function. Dawn, I see your hand first. Um, thank you for telling us that you grew up in the South of uh, Seattle. Um, transit station locations have been passionately debated in West Seattle and Chinatown International District. Yet sound transit and city officials have largely overlooked an area that would benefit from the rail the most, White Center, SeaTac, Des Moines, and Burien. What will you do to ensure that the rail will eventually reach largely Latino, Black, Southwest, and Southeast Asian diasporas to access jobs and services in the city? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I was I remember growing up when the, the one line was being put down. And so it's something that's certainly very, very close to me. Um, I think is we need to especially think about building for the next 300 years, not the next three years. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, I would like to see more um, partnership with those communities to figure out where are the right places to put those, those hubs, um, particularly with the um, the knowledge that we're going to be upzoning those areas. And we want to make sure that that upzoning helps preserve the communities that exist there. And I'm not talking about the actual buildings. I'm talking about the people. We want to make sure that people um, in those areas can continue to live there. And so what I would like to do is, is actually is review kind of what is um, what the proposal is currently and work more directly with community organizations in West Seattle to help uh, create a plan that works for them and the CID. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm i a retired landscape architect and I worked for 30 or 40 years as a small consultant to many um, various departments of the city. And I understand the city as a set of an interwoven set of departments, moving part, many, 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 many moving parts to make the city function every day. Um, you know, everything from uh, aquatic programs to, you know, streets and potholes and um, traffic control and, um, uh, and, and, and everything in between without getting, without getting too poetic about it. I'd like to ask you if you could share with us what your experiences in administration of a complex um, a complex entity it doesn't have to be quite as big as the city of Seattle. It's one of the most complicated um, entity you know a city our size is you know one of the most complicated entities in the world. Um, but can you just give us a sense of your experience uh, related to something this large? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And I think that's that's one of the unique challenges um, that, that come with the city. And, and one of the reasons I'm actually excited to to get more involved uh, beyond this can this uh, 
candidacy, just in general with the city as a whole. Um, I've done a lot of work. Um, so a, a lot of my professional experience comes from working uh, in privacy compliance. And compliance is not something that a lot of people really like to think about and work on. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing, uh, a lot of work that, that's involved in that is, you know, for lack of a better term, playing politics. You need to make sure that what are the interests of the different parties involved, not just the people that are going to be impacted by that, but also the, you know, are we actually in, uh, providing the incentives for people for those people that work in those careers to actually make good decisions and to make decisions that help benefit the community um, in the longer term? Um, and so part of that is going to be looking holistically at these at these different problems, like you like you mentioned, Barbara. Um, and so something that I would like to do is is create a little bit more of that um, interconnection between these different. Um, community, uh, different agencies, and really kind of approach it from like almost like a, a use case. Like, here's a problem that the city has. How are these different organizations, how are, the, how are these different agencies going to solve that? And what do we need to get there that we don't have today? Thank you. Alex, I see your hand. Please let's speed through these last couple ones so that everybody can have a chance. Alex? Hi, Tarek. Uh, really quickly, what are your views on the comp plan? Um, to be to be honest, uh, I'm I have not had a uh, had time to review the comp plan, um, mainly because uh, dealing with some personal and uh, work stuff. Um, I know in gen um, in general, I would like to what I would like to do is I would like to have more resources dedicated to build uh, to making communities a lot more sustainable, um, expanding housing um, in areas that are. Uh, where we we don't have we have a lot of people that are being priced out of those neighborhoods that we have, that they have grown up in, ensuring that we're creating incentives to meaningfully solve the right problems, not just put band aids and treat um, the the symptoms. Let's go and treat the root cause of these. Sorry, I can't give a detailed answer. That's all good, Don. Can you make yours really quick so that we can get Jeremy in too? Because you've had a question. Thank you. Sure. Um, it was, what are your plans to utilize and incentivize the 1 billion housing levy funds to increase affordable housing in the city? It's a fantastic question. Um, I think there's a, um, I am, um, I'll use this as a little soapbox to kind of express my disappointment at the, the uh, community connections um, ordinance didn't pass. Um, I grew up in the, the Cham refugee community and a lot of the people I know are from those communities and we were really relying on those to help build out um, community centers where um, not just our fam uh, not just families but also elders can continue to live connected with um, people that share that that background and that experience and so I would like to see a combination of uh, really really increasing um, land grants to um, to trusted community organizations um, providing them resources to help build um, homes around the centers that they built that they've had had for for the past years, uh, and also to um, really provide permitting that focuses on housing as a need and not as an investment. Thank you so much, Jeremy. You'll be our last question. Um, yeah, you 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 mentioned you talked about privacy a lot. Could you talk a little bit about Shotspotter, um, which is um, obviously the council this current council seems very excited about and what will you do? Yeah, no, uh, this, this came up in my stranger interview too. Um, so shot, I believe that shot spotter is, is it's again, it's another bandaid to our problem. There is a continual excitement about technology that as soon as the technology comes out, we want to figure out every way that you can use it without thinking about the downstream implications today. It's, okay, we're going to put a bunch of these microphones everywhere to listen for gunshots. Um, I know that in a year, someone's going to have the idea of, hey, there was a protest happening here. We want to gather evidence from those microphones. We have to think about ways that, one, are we using that technology to actually address a core problem and not just a symptom? Two, how can you show that this is better than um, the existing processes we have? And three, is this a good use of public funds beyond the question of, of privacy overall? Thank you so much. This concludes the formal part of our interview with you today. We'll wait for the